The Massey Lectures by Professor Northrop Fry. This is the second in the 1962 series, which Professor Fry is calling The Educated Imagination. Last week, our speaker began to develop a theory of literature, and tonight he continues his exploration in a lecture titled The Singing School. Northrop Fry is Professor of English and Principal of Victoria College in the University of Toronto. Professor Fry. In my first talk, where I shipwrecked you on a South Sea island, we discovered that the language of literature was associative. It uses figures of speech, like the simile and the metaphor, to suggest an identity between the human mind and the world outside it. That identity is what the imagination is chiefly concerned with. You may have noticed that we gradually shifted off the island back to 20th century Canada. There'd be precious little literature produced on your island, and what there'd be would be of a severely practical kind, like messages in bottles, if you had any bottles. The reason for that is that you're not a genuine primitive. Your imagination couldn't operate on such a world, except in terms of the world you know. Think of Robinson Crusoe, an 18th century Englishman from a nation of shopkeepers. He didn't write poetry. What he did was to open a journal in a ledger. But suppose you were enough of a primitive to develop a genuinely imaginative life of your own. You'd start by identifying the human and the non-human worlds in all sorts of ways. The commonest and the most important for literature is the God, the being who is human in general form and character, but seems to have some particular connection with the outer world, a storm god or sun god or tree god. Some peoples identify themselves with certain animals or plants called totems. Some link certain animals, real or imaginary, bulls or dragons, with forces of nature. Some ascribe powers of controlling nature to certain human beings, usually magicians, sometimes kings. You may say that these things belong to comparative religion or anthropology, not to literary criticism. I am saying that they are all products of an impulse to identify human and natural worlds that they're really metaphors, and become purely metaphors, part of the language of poetry, as soon as they cease to be beliefs, or even sooner. No society is too primitive to have some kind of literature. The only thing is that primitive literature hasn't yet become distinguished from other aspects of life. It's still embedded in religion, magic, and social ceremonies. But we can see literary expression taking shape in these things and forming an imaginative framework, so to speak, that contains the literature descending from it. Stories are told about gods and form a mythology. The gods take on certain characteristics. There's a trickster god, a mocking god, a boastful god. The same types of characters get into legends and folk tales. And as literature develops into fiction, rituals and dances take on dramatic form, and eventually an independent drama develops. Poems used for certain occasions, war songs, work songs, funeral laments, lullabies, become traditional literary forms. The moral of all this is that every form in literature has a pedigree, and we can trace its descent back to the earliest time. A writer's desire to write can only have come from previous experience of literature, and he'll start by imitating whatever he's read, which usually means what the people around him are writing. The young poet of Shakespeare's day would probably write about the frustration of sexual desire, a young poet today would probably write about the release of it. 
but in both cases the writing is conventional. The poet doesn't create out of nothing, and whatever he has to say, he can only say in a recognizably literary way. We can perhaps understand this better if we take painting as our example. There have been painters since the last ice age, and I hope there will be painters until the next one. They show every conceivable variety of vision and of originality in setting it out. But the actual technical or formal problems of composition involved in the act of getting certain colors and shapes on a flat surface, usually rectangular, have remained constant from the beginning. So with literature. In fiction, the technical problems of shaping a story to make it interesting to read to provide for suspense, to find the logical points where the story should begin and end, don't change much in whatever time or culture the story is being told. E.M. Forster once remarked that if it weren't for wedding bells or funeral bells, a novelist would hardly know where to stop. He might have added a third conventional ending, the point of self-knowledge, at which a character finds something out about himself as a result of some crucial experience. But weddings and deaths and initiation ceremonies have always been points at which the creative imagination came into focus, both now and thousands of years ago. If you open the Bible, you'll soon come to the story of the finding of the infant Moses by Pharaoh's daughter. That's a conventional type of story, the mysterious birth of the hero. It was told about a Mesopotamian king long before there was any Bible. It was told of Perseus in Greek legend. Then it passed into literature with Euripides' play Ion. Then it was used by Plotus and Terence and other writers of comedies. Then it became a device in fiction used in Tom Jones and Oliver Twist, and it's still going strong. You notice the popular literature the kind of stories that are read for relaxation is always very highly conventionalized. If you pick up a detective story, you may not know until the last page who done it, but you always know before you start reading exactly the kind of thing that's going to happen. If you read the fiction in women's magazines, you read the story of Cinderella over and over again. If you read thrillers, you read the story of Bluebeard over and over again. If you read westerns, you're reading a development of a pastoral convention, which turns up in writers of all ages, including Shakespeare. It's the same with characterization. The tricky or boastful gods of ancient myths and primitive folk tales are characters of the same kind that turn up in Faulkner or Tennessee Williams. I mentioned Plotus and Terence, writers of comedies in Rome 200 years before Christ, who took their plots mainly from still earlier Greek plays. Usually what happens is that a young man is in love with a courtesan. His father says nothing doing, but a clever slave fools the father, and the young man gets his girl. Change the courtesan to a chorus girl, the slave to a butler, and the father to Aunt Agatha, and you've got the same plot and the same cast of characters that you find in the novel of P.G. Woodhouse. Our principle is, then, that literature can only derive its forms from itself. They can't exist outside literature, any more than musical forms, like the sonata and the fugue, can exist outside music. This principle is important for understanding what's happened in Canadian literature. When Canada was still a country for pioneers, it was assumed that a new country, a new society, new things to look at, and new experiences would produce a new literature. So Canadian writers ever since, including me, have been saying that Canada was just about to get itself a brand new literature. But these new things provide only content. They don't provide new literary forms. Those can come only from the literature Canadians already know. People coming to Canada from, say, England in 1800 
started writing in the conventions of English literature in 1800. They couldn't possibly have done anything else. They weren't primitive and could never have looked at the world the way the Indians did. When they wrote, they produced second-hand imitations of Byron and Scott and Tom Moore because that was what they had been reading. Canadian writers today produce imitations of D.H. Lawrence and W.H. Auden for the same reason. The same thing happened in the States, and people predicted there that new Iliads and Odysseys would arise in the ancient forests of the New World. The Americans were a little luckier than we were. They really did have writers original enough to give them their national epics. These national epics weren't a bit like the Iliad or the Odyssey. They were such books as Huckleberry Finn and Moby Dick which developed out of conventions quite different from Homer's. Or is it really true to say that they're not a bit like the Iliad or the Odyssey? Superficially, they're very different. But the better you know both the Odyssey and Huckleberry Finn, the more impressed you'll be by the resemblances, the disguises, the ingenious lies to get out of scrapes, the exciting adventures that often suddenly turn tragic, the mingling of the strange and the familiar, the sense of a human comradeship stronger than any disaster. And Melville goes out of his way to explain how his white whale belongs in the same family of sea monsters that turn up in Greek myth and in the Bible. I'm not saying that there's nothing new in literature. I'm saying that everything is new, and yet, recognizably, the same kind of thing as the old. Just as a new baby is a genuinely new individual, although it's also an example of something very common, which is human beings, and also it's lineally descended from the first human beings there ever were. And what, you ask, is the point of saying that. I have two points. First, you remember that I distinguished the language of imagination or literature from the language of consciousness which produces ordinary conversation and from the language of practical skill or knowledge which produces information like science and history. These are both forms of verbal address where you speak directly to an audience. There is no direct address in literature. It isn't what you say, but how it's said that's important there. The literary writer isn't giving information, either about a subject or about his state of mind. He's trying to let something take on its own form, whether it's a poem or play or novel or whatever. That's why you can't produce literature voluntarily in the way you'd write a letter or a report. That's also why it's no use telling the poet that he ought to write in a different way so you can understand him better. He can only write out what takes shape in his mind. It's quite wrong to think of the original writer as the opposite of the conventional one. All writers are conventional because all writers have the same problem of transferring their language from direct speech to the imagination. For the serious, mediocre writer, convention makes him sound like a lot of other people. For the popular writer, it gives him a formula he can exploit. For the serious, good writer, it releases his experiences or emotions from himself and incorporates them into literature where they belong. Here's a poem by a contemporary of Shakespeare, Thomas Campion. When thou must home the shades of underground, and there arrive a new admired guest, the beauteous spirits do engirt thee round, white Iote, blithe Helen, and the rest. To hear the stories of thy finished love From that smooth tongue whose music held and moved. Then wilt thou speak of banqueting delights, Of mass 
rocks and rebels that seek you did make, of tyrannies and great challenges of night, and all these triumphs for thy duty's sake, when thou hast told these honors done to thee, then tell, oh tell, how thou didst murder me. This is written in the convention that poets of that age used for love poetry. The poet is always in love with some obdurate and unresponsive mistress whose neglect of the lover may even cause his madness or death. It's pure convention, and it's a complete waste of time trying to find out about the women in Campion's life. There can't possibly be any real experience behind it. Campion himself is a poet and a critic, and a composer who set his poems to his own musical setting and wrote a book on counterpoint. He was also a professional man who started out in law but switched over to medicine and served for some time in the army. In other words, he was a busy man who didn't have much time for getting himself murdered by cruel mistresses. His poem uses religious language, but not a religion that he could ever have believed in. At the same time, it's a superbly lovely poem. It's perfection itself. And if you think that a conventional poem can only be just a literary exercise, and that you could write a better poem out of a real experience, I'd be doubtful of your success. But I can't explain what Campion has really done in this poem without my second point. All themes and characters and stories that you encounter in literature belong to one big interlocking family. You can see how true this is if you think of such words as tragedy or comedy or satire or romance, certain typical ways in which stories get told. You keep associating your literary experiences together. You're always being reminded of some other story you read or movie you saw or character that impressed you. For most of us, most of the time, this goes on unconsciously, but the fact that it does go on suggests that perhaps in literature you don't just read one novel or poem after another, but that there's a real subject to be studied, as there is in a science, and that the more you read, the more you learn about literature as a whole. This conception of literature as a whole suggests something else. Is it possible to get in however crude and sketchy a way, some bird's eye view of what literature as a whole is about. Considered, that is, as a coherent subject of study and not just a pile of books. Several critics in the last few years have been playing with this suggestion, and they all begin by going back to the primitive literature that we spoke of a moment ago. For constructing any work of art, you need some principle of repetition or recurrence. That's what gives you rhythm in music and pattern in painting. A literature, we said, has a lot to do with identifying the human world with the natural world around it, or finding analogies between them. In nature, the most obvious repeating or recurring feature is the cycle. The sun travels across the sky and comes back again. The seasons go from spring to winter and back to spring again. Water goes from springs or fountains to the sea and back again in rain. Human life goes from childhood to death and back again in a new birth. A great many primitive stories and myths, then, would attach themselves to this cycle, which stretches like a backbone through the middle of both human and natural life. Mythologies are full of young gods or heroes who go through various successful adventures and then are deserted or betrayed or killed and then come back to life again, suggesting in their story the movement of the sun across the sky into the dark or the progression of seasons through winter and spring. Sometimes they're swallowed by a huge sea monster or killed by a boar or they wander in a strange dark underworld and then fight their way out again. Myths of this kind come into the stories of Perseus, Theseus, and Hercules in Greek myths, and they lurk behind many of the stories of the Bible. 
Usually there's a female figure in the story. Some of the critics I mentioned suggest that these stories go back to a single mythical story, which may never have existed as a whole story anywhere, but which we can reconstruct from the myths and legends we have. The poet Robert Graves has tried to do this in a book called The White Goddess. Graves has a poem called To Juan at the Winter Solstice. Juan is his son, and the winter solstice is Christmas time, the low point of the year when we set logs on fire or hang lights on a tree, originally to help make sure that the light of the world won't go out altogether. Graves' poem begins, There is one story and one story only that will prove worth your telling, whether a learned bard or gifted child. To it all lines or lesser gods belong that startle with their shining such common stories as they stray into. In Graves' version of the one story, the heroine is a white goddess, a female figure associated with the moon, who is sometimes a maiden, sometimes a wife, sometimes a beautiful but treacherous witch or siren, sometimes a sinister old woman or hag, belonging to the lower world, like Hecate and the witches in Macbeth. Graves would say that the eloquence and power of the Campion poem I just read you was the result of the fact that it evokes this white goddess in one of her most frequent aspects. The sinister witch in hell, gloating over the murdered bodies of her lovers. By saying it's the only story worth telling in literature, Graves means that the great types of stories, such as comedies and tragedies, start out as episodes from it. Comedies derive from the phase in which God and Goddess are happy wedded lovers. Tragedies from the phase in which the lover is cast off and killed while the white Goddess renews her youth and waits for another round of victims. I think myself that Graves' story is a central one in literature, but that it fits inside a still bigger and better known one. To explain what it is, I have to take you back for the last time, I hope, to the desert island and the three levels of the mine. You start, I said, by looking at the world with your intellect and your emotions. Occasionally, you have a feeling of identity with your surroundings, where you feel, I like this. But more often, you feel self-conscious and cut off from them. I mentioned Robinson Crusoe opening his journal and ledger. All he had to put into his ledger were the things against and in favor of his situation. And perhaps now we can see why he thought it was important to record them. If you were developing an imagination in your new world that belonged to that world, you'd start off something like this. I feel separated and cut off from the world around me, but occasionally I felt that it was really a part of me, and I hope I'll have that feeling again, and that next time it won't go away. That's a dim, misty outline of the story that's told so often of how man once lived in a golden age, or a garden of Eden, or the Hesperides, or a happy island kingdom in the Atlantic, how that world was lost, and how we someday may be able to get it back again. I said last day that this is a feeling of lost identity, and that poetry, by using the language of identification, which is metaphor, tries to lead our imaginations back to it. Anyway, that's what a lot of poets say they're trying to do. Here's Blake. The nature of my work is visionary or imaginative. It is an attempt to restore what the ancients called the Golden Age. Here's Wordsworth. Paradise and groves Elysian, fortunate fields, like those of old sought in the Atlantic main. Why should they be a history only of departed things? or a mere fiction of what never was. I, long before the blissful hour arrived, would chant in lonely peace the spousal verse. 
of this great consummation. Here's the H. Lawrence. If only I am keen and hard like the sheer tip of a wedge, driven by invisible blows, the rock will split. We shall come at the wonder. We shall find the Hesperides. And here's Yeats in his poem, Sailing to Byzantium, which has given me the title I have given to this talk, The Singing School. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless so clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. This story of the loss and regaining of identity is, I think, the framework of all literature. Inside it comes the story of the hero of a thousand faces, as one critic calls him, whose adventures, death, disappearance, and marriage or resurrection are the focal points of what later become romance and tragedy and satire and comedy and fiction, and the emotional moods that take their place in such forms as the lyrics that normally don't tell a story. We notice that modern writers speak of these visions of sacred golden cities and happy gardens very rarely, though when they do, they clearly mean what they say. They spend a good deal more of their time on the misery, frustration, or absurdity of human existence. In other words, literature not only leads us toward the regaining of identity, but it also separates this state from its opposite, the world we don't like and want to get away from. The tone literature takes towards this world is not a moralizing tone, but the tone we call ironic. The effect of irony is to enable us to see over the head of a situation. We have irony in a play, for example, when we know more about what's going on than the characters do. And so to detach us, at least in imagination, from the world we prefer not to be involved with. As civilization develops, we become more preoccupied with human life and less conscious of our relation to non-human nature. Literature reflects this. And the more advanced the civilization, the more literature seems to concern itself with purely human problems and conflicts. The gods and heroes of the old myth fade away and give place to people like ourselves. In Shakespeare, we can still have heroes who can see ghosts and talk in magnificent poetry. But by the time we get to Beckett's Waiting for Godot, they're speaking prose and have turned into ghosts themselves. We have to look at the figures of speech a writer uses, his images and symbols, to realize that underneath all the complexity of human life, that uneasy stare at an alien nature is still haunting us, and the problem of surmounting it still with us. Above all, we have to look at the total design of a writer's work, the title he gives to it, and his main theme, which means his point in writing it, to understand that literature is still doing the same job that mythology did earlier, but filling in its huge, cloudy shapes with sharper lights and deeper shadows. The Singing School number two in the current series of Massey Lectures. Northrop Fry, principal of Victoria College in the University of Toronto, is the speaker. The series will continue next Sunday. This is the CBC Radio Network.